you can either live in Hurricane Alley or you could live in a tornado alley. You know, you're, you're really a, a roll of dice with, with nature. We're gonna stay in Florida, we love it here. It's quiet, um, I love it here. Um, it's not all tornadoes and we don't want to be known for that. We've enjoyed a, a great run with no ca catastrophic damage on the coast. You know, we drew the short straw this time. We're gonna pay the price. If you live in an area where it rains, your house can flood. It's the most devastating, other than losing my parents, the most devastating thing I've ever been through. Well, I don't like to say that builders cut corners, but builders lobby for low standards and lobby for things that will reduce cost. I'm worried uh, for the world. If we look at climate action, we're not doing enough. Never thought in a million years that I'd be sitting here having this conversation with you. There's and earthquakes in California, there's tornadoes in Tennessee, and there's hurricanes on the, on the coast, on the southern coast. So it, you do, to some extent, pick your poison where you live, and, uh, and you know, the circumstances of our environment are a reality. So knowing what we know can happen, what are we doing about it? Well, I spent a career in the construction industry and saw firsthand what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong, and saw that the public is in the dark about what happens in the black box I call the construction industry. We've got to stop this insanity where we design to the bare minimum, build, have Mother Nature destroy it, we rebuild, only to have it happen again and again and again. We really don't know to what standards uh, our homes and communities are being built. Good. Builders are either giving us what we ask for, or when building a spec house, they're giving us what they think we'll buy. But that doesn't mean they're giving us a home that will survive a major disaster. We need a system that has more longer term liability for built uh, for purpose. In other words, when a home is built, it's not good enough to be built to code. It should be built to withstand the local hazards. And most of those local hazards are really known to us. So. I think the legal system needs to adapt to a higher standard of responsibility, I call it, liability perhaps, but definitely accountability to hold the, the builder, building community, to hold permitting officials, to hold the, the engineers and architects to a performance standard. The only one with true skin in the game is the owner of the house. For most people, that's our biggest investment. It all boils down to economics. If things are made more vulnerable, it's cheaper. And if it's cheaper and the customer is not willing to pay more for a resilient home, there's more profit. So it's all driven by profit. The damage major weather disasters cause is hard to imagine if you aren't there. In the case of Panama City and Mexico Beach, Florida, a city and a quiet little beach town were turned into a disaster zone in a matter of hours when Hurricane Michael hit. This community has, uh, has completely been altered and will be altered for a long time. It's changed, it's forever changed. Um, it's, it's stunning. We get uh, disoriented driving down the roads and I've lived here all my life. You know, we don't have the trees for landmarks or buildings. It's, it's sad. And they're gone. 80% of our city is destroyed. On October the 11th, in my walk down Highway 98, looking at our city, I, my thoughts were, how can three hours do this? We put a lot of infrastructure along the coast uh, that was not built to any code or standard or zoned properly, and we paid for it, and we're paying for it now. Water was coming in through every 
electrical, opening every light fixture, every fan, every heater in the ceilings. Hurricane Michael came right over Tyndall uh, to the west of us, and the eye wall was right where we're standing right now. There were, there were like apartment uh, condo units here. These were uh, four, four on the bottom, four on the top, facing the ocean. On the other side of that was another set, similar, and to the left, uh, toward that dumpster was uh, condo units, four on the bottom, four on the top. Bad weather isn't just confined to Florida. In 2019, tornadoes in Alabama leveled houses and took 23 lives. Paradise, California had a major wildfire in 2018 that killed 74 people and destroyed 13,000 structures. And in the same year in Southern California, over a quarter of a million people were evacuated and 1,643 structures were destroyed by fire. Well, my sense of loss is that, uh, that I don't know that a day doesn't go by that I don't realize that, uh, that, that the, the extent of this loss is almost overwhelming. I loved our house. We had, um, you know, had a, my kids were raised here. Um, there was a lot of memories here. And you wake up, it, it's, it's very strange because there are things that you don't even think about when you lose everything. We had a lot of antiques. The only one we saved was me, the old, the old fart. Certain types of natural disasters definitely are happening more often now and getting worse in some cases. No matter what your position is on global warming and why it's happening, the facts are clear that major weather disasters are getting worse and happening more frequently. If you wait for someone to solve this massive issue, you are putting your life and your property at risk. So the kinds of disasters that are happening more often and perhaps intensifying are related to the, o the oceans warming, the atmosphere warming, basically the changing climate system. We always hope that disasters are a wake-up call, but we're getting pretty used to them in a way, because every year we have disasters and they multiplying. The other really interesting aspect to this, which is much more cutting edge research, I'd say, is how hurricane tracks are changing. So if you think about Harvey, for example, Harvey came in the Gulf of Mexico, it got to Houston, and it stayed in place. It just got stuck in one spot. Florence did a very similar thing, came across the Atlantic, got to the, to the Carolinas, parked in place. And in both of those cases, those storms, because they were so stagnant, dumped this much rain in those places. So there is some new research that suggests that those kinds of tracks are more likely to happen now and in even more likely in the future. We're also seeing very clearly a tendency for storms to intensify much more rapidly. If we don't start to change our behavior, if we don't cut down on our CO2 emissions, if we don't move to renewable energy fast, if we don't take care of our natural resources better, if we don't really take care of nature to help us protect for that uncertain future, if we don't work together better, more inclusive, more comprehensive, then we're lost. I think, um, yes, that climate change is affecting things, and that's, that's significant. But again, part of human behavior we know is that we, we like to assign blame to risks caused by others. But I, I, in this sort of area, we also have to focus on what are, what are the risks that are being generated by human decisions more at the state, local, community level and individual level and where we choose to live. It isn't that we found new hazards, it's just we're expanding where they occur and the severity intensity of where they meet communities. I think that's an important question that we have to ask ourselves. In other words, where is the vulnerability so high that we should not be developing? Because when we develop in risky areas, it's not just that person there that is taking on that responsibility. It's the community that takes on the responsibility. So it's a liability for many more people. 
for society. We have to recognize that you know, the United States sits on a, a portion of the globe that has the most dynamic weather patterns of anywhere else in the world. And, you know, there's a risk living in this great country, and we have to figure out how to adapt and become resilient based on what Mother Nature throws at us. I'm a scientist, and this discussion on climate change has become almost religious. Um, from my point of view, when you look at the data, we have a direct impact on climate. You can argue about how much that impact is, uh, but yes, our climate is getting more erratic. Climate change basically says as you increase CO2, you change your, your heating and cooling of the world, and we're seeing changes. Do I think that climate change is occurring? Absolutely. Scientifically, it is absolutely happening. It is not a religion. It is the first Category 4 to hit the panhandle since 1851, the most powerful storm to hit the U.S. in the month of October ever. As Hurricane Michael headed towards land in October of 2018, many of the residents in the Florida panhandle thought the storm might miss them, or if it hit, at worst be a Category 2. But on October 10th, Michael came on shore as a Category 5 hurricane. Nearby Panama City Beach, a house ripped apart by the hurricane force winds. Windows shattered, buildings collapsed. Boats Immediately, uh, everything has changed. Just after the storm, power lines, trees, you couldn't leave, you couldn't go anywhere. Uh, you had no idea, there was no communication for weeks. Remember, so many of our homes were generational homes. We were old style Florida. We had slab on grade block houses, been passed down from, you know, through grandparents to, to kids to, to grandkids. We had never had Opal in 95. It was probably the worst storm that this little town, that wasn't a direct hit. We were definitely vulnerable for what Michael brought to us. Metal buildings did not fare well. High gabled ceilings or gabled walls did not do well. Churches did not do well. And that's, they were higher up in the wind column. Winds were devastating and so, those older buildings, metal buildings, glass storefronts did not hold up well to the storm. We've never had a storm of this magnitude. Nobody's ever had a storm of this magnitude. As a lifelong Floridian, Kimberly Smith and her family did what many do when a hurricane is coming. You dig in and you ride it out. They thought they were riding out at most a Category 2 hurricane. They never imagined a Category 5. The shingles blew off the roof. The shingles blew off the roof within about the first hour of the storm. And after that, um, because it was raining, torrentious rains, um, the water was coming through the roof where there were no shingles, down through the ceilings and through the walls. It, it saturated the walls and the ceiling. In my bathroom, the um, power lines fell on my house and made a hole in my roof and the roof in there, the ceiling in there, actually had a belly that was about to collapse. Smith is grateful they made it through and are able to rebuild. Her mom's home wasn't as fortunate. That's where the family's lifetime of memories were kept. My 74-year-old mom, the house that I grew up in, when we got there three days after the storm, we were walking on the front walls of her house. All of the things that she has saved our whole lives, our childhood ornaments and pictures and report cards, all of those things are gone. So when you take your 74-year-old mother to her house, and um, that, that's hard. That was probably the hardest. Believe it or not, just getting the debris out has been, I mean, that's a, over a $50 million expense to us. We have a three and a half million dollar budget. Three and a half million dollar annual budget. We're in excess of $50 million in debris. Uh, we lost our civic center, which is, was behind us. We lost our water tank. We lost our police department. We lost our fire department building. We still don't have a gas station. We still don't have a food store. We still don't have a bank. We've gotten so little help that we're gonna to have to fire 600 of our teachers and workers in schools 
That's huge. As the morning drive host on News Talk 101 in Panama City, Keith Kramer has lived with the aftermath of Michael every day with his listeners. What they've learned is that the wheels of rebuilding turn pretty slow after a disaster. They're concerned both politically, locally, about how, how slow things are moving, and then that, that trickles to state, and then it trickles up to Congress. It's really amazing how, how slow the process is and how mucked up the process uh, is. And you know, people are, are living in tents. People, we get phone calls from people that are living in tents. Businesses, that 50% of our businesses are no longer operating. That affects commerce. It affects lives. People have uh, moved out. A lot of people have moved out. We don't even have, I don't think, a census to really tell us uh, how many people have moved out. The wildfires out west have certainly been um, increasing in their numbers and their area coverage and also their intensity. The fire season has gotten longer. And to have a, a good fire season, what you need is very dry conditions for a long time, so drought basically. And we're also seeing um, some years there is some rain in the winter and snowpack. Um, this last winter was an abundant year for precipitation in the Sierra Nevada. When that happens, we get a lot of vegetation growing in the summer because there's a lot of water available for the weeds to grow, basically. And that just provides fuel to help fires get started. Paradise, California is the worst disaster I've ever seen in my life. And I've been doing this for my whole career. It's the worst thing I've ever seen. At the other end of California, closer to the ocean, is the fire that hit Malibu. Different issues than what those in Paradise faced, but yet another example of how things can go wrong when disaster strikes. Fires have been burning the earth since the cavemen walked the planet. Uh, the biggest problem now to me isn't global warming, it's people. Um, it's the construction, it's the vegetation that shouldn't be here, it's the palm trees, it's the cars. It's, we've had fires here since the beginning of time. They're getting worse because maybe people are living where they're really not supposed to live. Uh, this was called the yo-yo fire. You're on your own. Jefferson Wagner was the mayor of Malibu. The word he used to describe the fire is devastating. Seven months after it happened, they still hadn't finished removing all the debris. In all of 90265, the Malibu zip code, we lost 772 homes, 460 in the city of Malibu. Dick and Richard Corman lost everything they owned in the fire. It's tough to rebuild at any age, let alone at Dick's age of 90. And nothing brings back a lifetime of personal belongings. They're, they're more than memories. They're actually artifacts we had. But they're gone. They're gone forever. Fortunately, in our office, we had uh, three, four filing cabinets that to go. Because we always have, in case there's an earthquake or fire, these things go in the car. Fortunately, we put those in. We missed a few things, like my teddy bear, <laughs> which I had since I was a little bitty baby, and uh, a few things like that. But anyway, we saved all the records, our insurance records and papers, and that was it. We had a great big box of coins and we should have taken us with it because they melted down to nothing. <laughs> the car, oh, it was a 51 MG TD. And also we had a uh, Mercedes. I think it was, a, say, a 2006 Mercedes. It wasn't working too good, it was something was wrong, so we took the insurance off of that, unfortunately. <laughs> Everything melted down to nothing. Mr. Corman's 86-year-old wife is wheelchair-bound and has dementia. So being displaced from home is even more challenging. How do you start over at 90? Perhaps by having a great attitude about life. Yeah, I'm 90 and a half years old, so who knows? Just hang in there, that's what I tell them. They say, how you doing? I say, I'm hanging in there, hanging in there. Come on, sweetie. No, no Woolsey. No, Woolsey stays up on deck. Carolyn Carradine and her husband Chris were forced to evacuate their home and they weren't close to ready. While the threat of fire is always a way of life here, this fire was different. I'm third generation native Californian. The Santa Ana winds we get every year. We've never had the power company turn off the power before. I mean, one day you have everything, and we had 
I'm an only child. My great-grandmother was a famous opera singer. My, fa my husband's father was a famous actor. We had all of the memorabilia. For the residents of Malibu that suffered so much loss, they were left with the feeling that something could have been done to help save their homes. We watched our house burn on TV with the only person there was a news person saying they decided to let this one yeah. go. Our 22 years of living here, our entire life went up in flames while they said we decided to let this one go. Not one fireman, no fire trucks, no airplanes. How about, we've got an ocean. Why aren't you pumping water from the ocean? You all, all of you, every single friggin' one of you should be so ashamed. You fought for weeks about plastic straws and let our town burn. How dare you, how dare you? The only thing left standing at the Carradines was a pizza oven that they had imported from Italy years ago. And that's the only thing that is left standing. I should have put my jewelry in the pizza oven and not in the fireproof safes. Four fireproof safes completely burned and everything in them. I don't know, how, how do you start at 72 all over again? I miss all the little simple things that validated the, the amount of time that the two of us spent together and the amount of time we spent raising our children and the amount of time that we spent growing up and, you know, being a part of the planet. It's all gone. It's all gone. The most important thing is having a plan. And unfortunately, a lot of people try to make that plan during the fire. If you live in an urban interface area, the plan needs to be made from the moment you live there. It, it's the, the saves we have, our clients who saved homes, none of them woke up on the day and saved their home. All the infrastructure was in place, all the planning, all the rehearsal, all the fire drills, long before the fire ever came. That's why they were successful in their actions. Go into your house and go room by room and just stand there and think, what would I really miss that I could put in my car? Obviously not the grand piano or the clock or anything like that, but the drawing that this young man did of my grandmother when she was 16 and he was killed in World War I, you know, that kind of thing that I just ache for. Those things, and I would make a list, and then, because you don't think straight when you have to evacuate, and then I would take that list and go through and pull that stuff and take it to the car. So why do we keep taking these chances and risking everything we have? Maybe we think it can't happen to us, and if it did, it would never happen again. We'll take the house. Garb. Honey, honey, the chances of another plane hitting this house are astronomical. See, it's been pre-disastered. It'll be safe here. It's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen to me. And even in more, when it happened in 99, we thought, it'll never happen again. What are the chances that an F5 is going to hit this city again? And it did. Welcome to more. Hang on for the ride. <laughs> well, most people don't realize that with a hurricane, you get a day or two or a week to prepare to put plywood on the wall. A tornado can arrive in less than 10 minutes. Tornadoes have been in the, have been a factor in our civilization since the beginning of time. Tornadoes are part of nature. They're such extreme events and there's such a low probability per individual house that they were excluded from the building codes. It is understandable that uh, we did not design for tornadoes. Since 1999, there have been eight tornadoes in Moore, Oklahoma. Four of them have been EF4s or 5s. In addition to taking lives and causing damage, it's something survivors never forget. We had all just got out of school and uh, we were sitting at the house just hanging out and tornado sirens started going off and so we turned on the news channel and Gary England said, uh, I'll tell you folks from Blanchard to Southwest Oklahoma City to the Dell City area, more Right now, it may turn a little bit to the north of Norman, but right now it's moving northeast, paralleling Interstate 44. Uh, this is a storm that you need to be below ground level. We all went and got in my bedroom closet and stayed in there while the tornado came by, tore off a little bit of the roof and blew out all the windows in the house. And we stayed in there until it was done, came out, and 
Right around the corner from my mom's house, it was leveled everywhere. It's the loudest and then the most silent thing at the same time. I heard the, heard it as it was uh, going through a neighborhood and just the cracking of the wood and the insulation uh, fell in the sky and just the roar of this, this monster just tearing through a neighborhood. And then you look and you see the destruction and there really are no words. It, it looks like a bomb went off in a neighborhood because it's just a huge pile of rubble. If you're at the center point of an EF5 or 4 tornado, if a Cat 4 or 5 uh, hurricane is coming your way, uh, you know, you're not going to wrestle that down. But we can limit uh, the effect and shrink down the footprint of these disasters. Those high wind events, uh, there are 110 and 90 and 70 and 50 mile an hour bands that are there. We need not lose roofs in those occasions. We can see the impact of those disasters shrink. We've got to prevent the avoidable part of those losses. That we can do. In a way, what happens after a disaster that everything that is vulnerable falls apart. So all of a sudden you see your vulnerability exposed massively. It's a disaster is like showing everything of your, and in that sense, if you would make an x-ray of a, 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 human, uh, a, a human being, you would also see the vulnerabilities or an MRI scan or whatever. So the x-ray exposes that. So that is also then the responsibility. If you are exposed in your vulnerability, you can act upon that understanding. If you then know what the uh, interdependencies between those vulnerabilities are, then you can start to connect the dots. Come up with plans for the future, not in response to the past, and really prepare better. So I think we always frame this in, in building back better, but building back better is not enough. And the disaster is a momentum you have to use, it's a responsibility. It's not fun, eh? people really die with disasters, we have real casualties, real losses. So it's, it's not that never waste a good crisis all of a sudden becomes a party, but it is a responsibility of all uh, actors in place to use that momentum as a way to really leapfrog towards the future. In the case of Moore, city leaders knew they had to do something to cut down on the massive amounts of damage. So after the 2013 EF5 tornado that killed 24 people and destroyed 300 homes, it was time to change things. In March of 2014, the city of Moore adopted um, a building code that was the first one in the United States to deal with tornadoes, high wind events on residential structures. By the end of 2014, all the new homes going in were required to be built to the new standard. And it, it doesn't add that much cost. We haven't seen a slowdown in, in home building or anything in the city of Moore. Um, so, and I think our citizens feel safer knowing that those standards are in place. We know we can build to handle up to an EF3 at a cost of between one and a half to two dollars per square foot, which is actually roughly the cost of the granite countertop in a kitchen. So for the cost of the granite countertop, you can actually have a better home that is better built, that's going to last longer, it's going to handle higher winds. So whose job is it to make our home safer? The builder or the buyer? The home buyer. If they want it to a higher standard, they need to tell their home builder what they want. The fact they changed the building code and more is a big deal. Because as Haworth told us, many homeowners would still choose the granite countertops if they weren't forced to build to the new code. If we just had this code and said, okay, if you want your home built to that code, I'll figure the cost and tell you what, it'll, what the difference will be, people probably wouldn't do it. But where it's mandated, all the homes are being built to that code. And so I think that's a good thing. Tampa, Florida is a city that hasn't had a strong hurricane since 1921, but there have been several storms to hit the area that left their share of damage. What's frightening is a study of the area that was done called the Hurricane Phoenix scenario to see what would happen if a storm like Hurricane Michael hit this area, and the impact would be staggering. Hurricane Phoenix was the type of scenario where you're looking at a 15 to 20, maybe even a 25 foot storm surge coming on shore 
uh, from the bay. It was devastating, especially to the downtown area, uh, taking out numerous uh, roadways, of course, structures, uh, houses, homes, businesses. The mock hurricane scenario was done in 2010. The population has exploded in this area since then. At the time, they projected 470,000 homes would be destroyed, 10,000 businesses, 2 million people would need medical assistance. It's really hard to wrap your head around those types of numbers because it's not something that you're exposed to on a regular basis, so it really is really hard uh, to grasp and imagine what that really looks like. People have to believe that, uh, that we, we are really on, uh, on almost unrented time. You haven't been exposed to a risk. Uh, your perception is, does that risk really exist? Living in the Tampa Bay region is truly living in paradise, but living in paradise comes with great responsibility. And it really does come with responsibility. And what does that mean? That means learn how to become resilient uh, where you live, ideally in the structure you live in. Building officials, are, are sold that, you know, inexpensive homes, meaning low standards, will be more affordable. A lot of times people fight us, particularly on the special flood hazard area, that if we expand the area based on what we believe is, you know, an accurate depiction of the 1% flood or the 100 year percent flood, people actually fight us because it requires them to get insurance if they live in a community that is a part of the National Flood Insurance Program. That's a problem. Uh, we're telling you that you live in a very vulnerable area, but yet people do not want to be, do not want to pay a couple hundred extra bucks to get the policy uh, to insure their livelihood. We see it year after year in this country, people who lose everything in a disaster. The strategy of denial or hope just isn't working. You're rolling the dice if you choose to live there, do nothing about the risk. One of the cliches in emergency management is hope is not a strategy. You have to be properly insured. Insurance is the first line of defense. FEMA's individual assistance program, if you are uninsured and lose your house, is not going to make you whole. It is designed to kickstart recovery. The first line of defense is insurance. Well, you uh, buy insurance, health, you buy health insurance, but you hope and pray that someday that you don't ever have to use it. Same with uh, residential insurance. You know, and often you're, you're, you're told that you likely won't have to use it. And if you do, you don't need so much, uh, so don't buy so much so that you'll continue to buy the insurance. And you're not, I can't tell you how many people uh, that have called the, the radio show to say that uh, they had no idea what was in their insurance policy. No clue. No clue about what's in their insurance policy. It's been sitting in a safe for five years. No one ever bothered to read it. No one ever bothered to think, well, if a hurricane does come, then wh what are we going to do if we have to move out of our house? No one's ever thought about that. And the insurance agents, they don't, they don't really cover that. It's not really that big of a deal. I think one of the biggest challenges is that a lot of people have the mentality, this is never going to happen to me, and you know, it's not that bad. The government will pick up the tab and my insurance will pay to put it back together, and they will. But the problem is, you know, the insurance company can give you the money after a natural disaster, but they can't replace your high school letterman's jacket. They can't replace your grandma's picture. They can't replace your child's baby blanket. Whatever that thing is that's precious to you, if it's gone, it's gone. But the simple lesson is that preparedness pays, uh, that uh, cleaning up after a disaster, repairing the damage, uh, collecting your losses uh, is, a, is a big effort, uh, while a less bigger effort is to prepare better. When you look at all the destruction that took place in Mexico Beach, Florida, there's one house that was noticeably left standing on the waterfront. We were finished in April of this year and of course Hurricane Michael hit October 10th. But the first thing we did was well in advance of any building plans, well in advance of, of anything, is we made up our mind that uh, we wanted to try to build a home that would last for generations. In terms of building to code, I, I can't comment on that because we didn't, we, we exceeded the code. We had an engineer make sure that we complied and fulfilled all the codes, but we never began any piece of the house with the, with the idea that we were just going to build to code. We knew that as a minimum, but we really built to our comfort level with the, with the mindset of, you know, what winds would we be facing, what storm surge would we be facing, and, uh, and those sorts of things. What you see is 12 feet above the ground. What you don't see is 28 feet below the ground. Those pilings are 28 feet deep in, in the ground. They're 40 feet long overall. Even when you think you've done everything right, 
hurricanes have a way of finding any loose ends and leaving their mark. Well, when we're, when we're talking about a strong house, uh, you, have to, you have to talk about from the ground to the top. And right now we're on the top floor and we're looking at the bottom of, of my roof. And we're actually looking through a space where the panel was taken away. The reason that panel we think was taken away is because of that outlet and the small gap that would have been created in that panel to allow that outlet to come through and, and show it the surface. That defeated a sealed ceiling, or so we thought. And when we rebuild this, you can be assured there will not be a hole for an outlet or anything else for that matter in this ceiling. That's what compromised that small segment. Our house worked just like any scientist would be wise to make use of all the data. I've now got a house that's been tested by a hurricane and there's data here. There's things I can see and I would like to make this house even better. So how do they raise the bar in a community like Mexico Beach so they survive the next disaster? You focus on codes, and I think rightfully so, because that says what we're going to build in the future needs to be built with all of the information and science coming to bear. Yet 99% of people live in something that was built a decade, two, or even 40 or 50 years ago, well before the codes and the science that we have today was available. And so we've got to find ways to begin to look at retrofits of the current homes so that they can withstand wind. So we've developed quite a bit of work you can do on roofs related to how you can withstand high wind. The codes are fabulous for what is not yet built. We've got to serve the rest of the citizens, the rest of the residents that are in those areas that live in today's housing stock. Should the federal government and the taxpayers continue to rebuild communities to the same pre-disaster standard? I, I don't believe that we should. The Mexico beaches of the world that have been through this have a real opportunity to set the example of how to be a resilient coastal community going forward and ultimately it will benefit them. I believe that, that people will come in and rebuild, but let's just hope that they do it to a much higher standard to prevent this from happening again. The debate that takes place in the wake of a disaster is what should the new standard be? Mexico Beach raised the wind rating from 130 miles per hour to 140 and adjusted the flood level higher, but is that enough? If you want to prepare for the biggest, eh, like that one house, house on Mexico Beach that was still standing in the New York Times, did this whole article about this man that wanted it to stand for the big storm. If that's what you, if that's what you want as a community, as businesses, as government, then that's what you have to do. If you say, I'm okay, that I lose some property or some, uh, I lose some structures with a real extreme event and I can rebuild that fairly easy because I changed my codes in such a way that the critical infrastructure will always be there but I'll, I'm okay with losing some, then that is what you do. So I, it, that's little different than only saying uh, uh, the storm won't come. It's more complex. Well, I think South Florida after Andrew kind of set the lead and the rest of the Gulf Coast, the rest of the Atlantic Coast, should really duplicate South Florida's wind standard. I think that's the only real assurance that we have today that we can protect our community. So South Florida's standards starts at 175 miles an hour, and depending on the significance of the, of the building, can go up to, let's say, 200 miles an hour. And we've shown that it can be done, and we've shown in recent events that the losses are much less by following that code. So there's no reason why the rest of the Gulf and Atlantic coast should not adopt South Florida's building code. At the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, they put houses through rigorous testing to see what it takes to survive disasters. We have 105 fans, 350 horsepower. When they're all running at full capacity, we can create about 130 mile an hour wind, which is a category three hurricane. So there's several things that you can do as a homeowner in a hurricane prone area that would help give you more resilient building. Some of those same techniques will work in tornado prone areas as well. Um, but things like making sure you've got a wind rated roof cover. Um, if you, if you are purchasing a new house or building a new house, getting uh, what we call a continuous load path in the house. That's basically going to connect the walls to the roof and the foundation to keep everything tied together. Choosing uh, impact rated windows uh, and impact rated doors or it, having a shuttering system when a hurricane threatens is really important to keep the wind and water out. If you're building a new house from scratch or replacing a roof, 
adding in a, a sealed roof deck is a good idea so that if the roof cover is, is compromised, you've got a second line of protection to keep the water out. So what I would tell people is that you should look very closely um, at what the actual risk is uh, where you've decided to live because there's a lot of things that one can do to address some critical elements of the risk. In hindsight, we probably should have thought about it more when we were house shopping. We were looking at kitchens and bathrooms and bedroom sizes. Just never thought about looking at the attic when you go to a house. Here we go. <sighs> Miss some milk? The problem with people buying houses is we're drawn to the icing and decorations on the cake without understanding the true ingredients. I feel like people look at their attic to whether they can finish the room or not or put their Christmas tree up there or not. Is it going to keep water out? Is it going to keep my family safe? So I think what people should learn is what are my problems? Get that evaluation of their building. Find out if products like your close health foam, which can do four or five things with just one process, are going to pay off. And then finally, again, labor. You get the right person that comes out that knows exactly what they're doing. They're confident in it. They don't mind having a third party verifier or inspector come out. And it's really not that expensive. Uh, you can get a performance test for around $150 and typically $75 for every visit. Habitat for Humanity, for example, on their own initiative, and they build low cost houses for low income people, they have adapted a higher standard than the codes in Alabama and, and other Gulf Coast areas because they realize that it's really the most economic solution. So they have found ways to bring the cost down of building more resilient homes. Hurricane Michael destroyed a lot of homes in the Florida Panhandle, but the Habitat for Humanity homes held up pretty well. The roof held, that was uh, a big concern, obviously, but with all the roofs that have had damage and everything, um, my roof didn't have any damage. I'm not sure why everybody isn't building the same way as these guys are, but I do know that there are certain codes and standards in the state of Florida, and Habitat definitely abides by those and, and exceeds those. Well, the first thing is, and I think others are doing this part, which is building the code. Uh, beyond code, we do uh, extra steps. Uh, some of the things like anchoring to the floor, we do at about twice the closeness of uh, what is code. Uh, we put things together with extra fastening, fasteners. I think people have a, a misconception that it has to cost, you know, only rich people can afford uh, better resilient buildings, and that's just not true. I have a peace of mind. I have people telling me that if there ever was another hurricane and they couldn't get out, they know where they're coming. So. I think it all boils down to money. Um, you know, I think that uh, unfortunately we try to do things as cost effective and cheap as we can. And uh, it, 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 it hurts us. What makes it even more tragic to see people lose everything in a disaster is when we have existing technology that could have prevented it. In the case of earthquakes, the current building code will save lives, but not necessarily your property. The big earthquake hit in San Francisco or LA, especially San Francisco, the tall buildings all over the places. We're gonna half our buildings. We're not gonna be able to use them. We set up the code like that because you know I think it's because uh, it's cheap, cheap to build like that, and uh, if, because if you make it a little stronger, it be become more expensive. But that's almost like a tradition. The way the building code is set up is basically minimum life safety, right? Technology definitely exists. It's readily available to make the building safer and better, and actually you may be able to get back to living again as soon as earthquake hits. For example, in Japan, uh, they use a thing called base isolation. Okay, let's imagine the building sits on the ground, right? It's a rigidly tied in like this. What's going to happen? Earthquake shake, building shake with them and that causes the, the essentially damage in the building. What base isolation does is you kind of provide an air gap between the ground and the building. The building doesn't move, right? But obviously you can have an air gap, so what we have is rollers. It's just basically rollers between this. So therefore, that when the ground moves, the building can stay in. That's the uh, base isolation. I think over 10,000 building, buildings in Japan have this technology. Here in California, I would say we have about 200, maybe 300, that's it. So much like with wind codes and fire codes, why aren't we using this technology more? 
because we're not demanding it. It's insane. It's uh, crazy not to doing it. it. It just doesn't make sense to me, especially those high-rise condo buildings in San Francisco, or LA, or San Diego, or Portland, or Seattle. We're gonna expect to see the big earthquake there. Maybe today, maybe five years from now, 20 years from now, chances are like 80% and higher. So which means almost, or oh, it is actually guaranteed it's gonna happen. Much like with earthquakes, the technology is out there that can help avoid fire damage. But many people are either unaware it exists or choose to roll the dice and hope it doesn't happen to them. You can totally live in this environment and protect yourself from burning. There's, you can mitigate the landscaping around you. You could get rid of the ornamental vegetation that's really dangerous. You could harden a home through construction methods. If you're building from the ground up, you could build a fireproof house. And then there's suppression systems and ways to mitigate the actual fires when they occur. We literally have something for every budget. I've had someone save their house, a little cottage in the T fire in, in Montecito for a $400 investment. Tiny little cottage needed a few gallons of a gel, was able to apply from a garden hose. We've had people spend upwards of $200,000 on systems. It's really all the scale of it. The main difference that we see between buildings that do well in fires versus those that don't is the, the use of a defensible space and choosing non-combustible materials. If you own an older home but didn't make a plan how to save it from a disaster, putting it back together may be unaffordable. A lot of people living here in Malibu, they moved out here years ago. They bought their houses for less money than the new foundation is going to cost. And these fires are devastating. They can't even afford to, the foundation. One of the worst types of damage homeowners suffer is from water. It's a resource so crucial to our survival, but a key ingredient in taking or destroying lives. We're seeing the years of construction in certain areas that were floodplains. The more construction, the less area that the water can be stored in, right? Houston's a great point, a great area to look at. You know, they had three significant events in three years that really caused major destruction. Some of those folks that were flooded, 80% of those homes weren't even in a special flood hazard area, an A or a V zone, which is what we know as our high risk area. They were in low to moderate risk areas, shaded X zones. And over a three year period, these folks were flooded three times. So they're becoming more and more frequent. And that's why it's so critical and important that property owners become educated. So flood water can cause some significant damage to a home. An inch of water can cause close to $20,000 in overall damage to a home. Flood water entered into your first living floor could cause you to have to gut four feet of sheetrock and all your floors, replace all the wiring. There's only three ways to deal with flood. You can move out of the way, you can build higher and stronger, or at a neighborhood or community scale, you can change where the water is going to go through some kind of drainage um, project or some kind of flood defense. At an individual level, the choices are simply, where is that house situated and is it high enough? The foundation is the, the core element to support an elevated home in the floodplain. And if that foundation fails during a flood, the whole house can be compromised. So, what now? Now we rebuild. Yeah, you know, these movies cause a lot of problems for emergency responders and decision makers, right? In fact, I, I tell my students one of the problems is, is that the American public goes to movies and in an hour and 40 minutes a big bad thing happens and, and uh, an hour and 40 minutes later everything is fine. So uh, one of the important issues for emergency managers is getting the public to recognize it can be a really long, painful haul from when the impact hits to when you feel like things have reached usually a new normal. If we're going to build back, we should be only building back in ways that are much more resistant to the, um, the impact consequences that, that occurred the first time. Or, or we build back in a different location. I don't mind where people want to rebuild, I just hope they do it smarter. And if they don't, then why is FEMA on the hook for the next disaster in that location if they don't do it? I can move a mountain, but if I put it on the wrong side of the road, then I've wasted a lot of time, energy, and effort. It would be really uh, advantageous for people moving into areas where disasters occur to contact professionals in the private industry to see what options are available for those things, be it a hurricane, uh, 
tornado, fire. Mother Nature doesn't know what 1% annual chance flood means. And those 80% of folks that got flooded from Harvey wish they had an agent explaining that to them because they could have bought it for less than $300 a year and had financial protection. The truth is that if people knew how important having a resilient home is and would value it, they definitely would be better off. Their investment would be protected, their possessions would be protected, and more important, their lives and that of their families would be protected. I think you roll the dice no matter where you live. If you, you could probably go to Oklahoma City right now and say you're rolling the dice. You can go out to California where there's earthquakes, you're rolling the dice. It's no matter where you are, you're always going to have some type of susceptibility to a vulnerable hazard or risk. I think the proof is there. The political will is missing, and obviously there's strong lobbying against raising standards because the, the concern is the following, that the consumer yet is not aware and is not, let's say, educated and willing to value resilience. Like the consumer has become aware of the value of organic foods, of green products, of conservation, of safe cars, and we're willing to value those things. So we need to bring the consumer level up so that they're willing to pay more for a resilient home and then the builder will say, it's worth for me to build it. I can make a profit. Hopefully, we can have builders making a greater profit with resilient homes than they do with vulnerable homes. This is the age-old problem that, that FEMA's always had, is how do we create a true culture of preparedness? It is goal number one in our strategic plan going forward. And every day we are trying to understand how to get people to uh, realize that they are the true first responder. <laughs> They can control their own destiny when impacted by disasters if they do some simple things, low to no cost mitigation or become financially resilient, you know, up front. And we're trying to put that word out and change the narrative on asking people to be prepared. Mother Nature will have the final say. The fastest way for the quality and safety of our homes to increase is for all of us to start demanding more from the people we buy from or build with. That means understanding what to ask for and making the commitment to get it done. If you take a close look at all the victims of disaster, in many of the cases, their destiny might have changed completely if they had done something to make their home safer. The industry will respond to the consumer. If the consumer doesn't ask for it, the law allows it, and you can make money, you will keep building vulnerable homes over and over and over again. And that's what's happening today. What can I afford to lose without total financial ruin? And what can I do about it if I'm still going to live there? Because there are many interventions that can be done in any of these risk situations that can reduce the consequences if the hazard does occur. When you have a choice about where to live, um, you can take all of those factors into place and maybe you'll choose one house over another. But for many American families, there's not a lot of choosing to do. We watch um, houses that are passed down from generation to generation. You look at the central part of North Carolina, Lumberton, and the areas outside of Fayetteville, they were hit by Matthew and again by Lawrence. Many of those homes, maybe a majority of those homes, were legacy homes. They'd been passed down from generation to generation. They didn't make an active choice about where to live. In many instances, most Americans are living proximate to family, school, and jobs. People start to wake up when it hits their wallets, more than it when it hits their community. Well, I think the most common argument today being uh, proposed by the industry and also by officials is affordability. We can't afford it. And, and I like to say, you know, it's not a question of affordability, it's a question of priorities. This country by itself spends $300 billion a year on renovations on re and remodeling. How much of that is actually spent on making our homes and properties more resilient? I'd say probably less than 5%, probably less than 2 or 1%. If we just prioritize better and made resilience a higher importance in our choices, I think we, we do a lot more. And we can't do this alone. That's why resilience can only be delivered by government, industry, as well as the building community, all working together with a common goal. And that common goal is to really make buildings better, make them stronger, make them last longer. We've got to make sure that elected officials understand you got to put these building codes in place. And then FEMA is having to change the audience. Um, 
We've got to get to the financial advisors, the realtors and communities and the insurance agencies of saying, please talk people into insurance, not out of insurance. You know, we don't have as many lights, and so uh, at night, if the sky's clear, I can see all the stars. And whatever led people to Mexico Beach to begin with, it's all still here. We've got beautiful white sand, we've got sunsets over water. Um, it's, it's a beautiful place. Dolphins in the ocean and a beautiful beach. The pier will, will get rebuilt. And, um, and the things that brought people to Mexico Beach in the 1940s and 50s are the things that will bring them back today. And a lot more people know about it now. I'm definitely hopeful because uh, humans are a crazy species. And in the end of the day, you don't like to get killed. Uh, not by a storm or a gun or whatever. Uh, so you try to protect your first level of defense is to make yourself more secure. I look forward to a moment where some of these more online real estate uh, tools begin to package that all together so that when the pictures come up of the um, uh, pretty dining room in the apartment, the countertops in the restroom, uh, in the balcony or uh, the school, you're seeing that kind of information at the exact same time. That's where we need to be at as it goes forward. What price are you willing to pay to keep things just the way they are? Are you willing to continue to risk your home? Are you willing to continue to risk all your possessions and family heirlooms? Are you willing to continue to risk your life and the life of your family? Or do you want to do what's necessary to be the last house standing? Really, when it's over, you are the one that's going to be responsible to cover your ass. As, uh, as, as cold as that sounds, that is the truth. That's the truth.